Alright, and welcome to this tutorial on C Sharp. Uh, C Sharp is a fantastic language to go about learning, and lots of the building blocks that you would have learned in Visual Basic or um, earlier languages will serve as a good foundation for learning how to make some really good code. Um, C Sharp is a language that um, there's lots of job opportunities for. If you go into Trade Me Jobs or Seek IT, you'll find that there's lots of um, programming type environments available using this language. Uh, it's often one that is used at um, university as well as one of the first year computer science program papers that they teach at Waikato University here. Um, and once you know C Sharp to a pretty good level you'll be able to look at um, languages such as Java and notice a lot of similarities between the two languages so there is a lot of crossover. So I'm using um, Visual Studio Community Edition here um, which is a free version. Um, if you are using an older version of C Sharp you'll see much the same functionality. It just uh, may look a little bit different from what you're seeing here tonight. Alright, so first up when we um, enter into the program you'll see this kind of splash screen. One of the things I like to do when I first come into this program is to go about setting some options whereby we might like to default um, certain things such as the language that we might like to look at using but probably the, the main one that I would like to look at is whereabouts all the projects are going to be stored. So if you're wanting to have a common location for these to be stored, um, such as your network folder, this is a good place to go about setting those now. So I'm just going to let those happening um, by default at this stage, so at the moment it's going to be going to a folder on my desktop that I set up called Programming, and I could also set these project templates as well to be the same location if I want, but this is going to be the default location that it's going to want to save to at this point. So go back clicking OK and it will go about looking to um, bring you back to this environment and we're just going to go click on Start New Project. From in here you'll be presented with all the different languages that you can pick up. So one of the languages that I'm also using here at the moment is Visual Basic. So wanting to make sure that I go through and choose Visual C Sharp as my tool of choice here. Underneath on the right hand side you've got several options for being able to work with Windows Forms. This um, thing that I'm moving around at the moment is a Windows form and these forms have certain properties which kind of come along with it such as you know the, the close button and the minimize restore buttons are normally um, going to be available. This one here however um, does have a few other bits and pieces that we'll potentially get into at some later stage but at this stage we're going to focus just purely on the code and the syntax on how we write this code. So I'm going to be using something called a console application which is pretty much a black window that will appear and if you were to go through the likes of um, the command prompt something like this is pretty similar to what you'll see. You'll see a black window that appears with some writing um, and it's a pretty simple way of learning some of the heavy going natures of programming languages without getting too caught up into things like text boxes and properties etc that um, Windows Forms have available to it. So the first thing that we want to try and do is to give this a name, so I'm going to use some kind of obvious name, first program might be something to try and start with, and then we'll go ahead and click on OK, and it will go through and start C Sharp for the first time. So when it pops up and you'll see it, um, compared to Visual Basic there's a lot more code that is clearly visible, and this code is basically talking to you about um, types of things that are loaded up and ready for us to use straight away. So generally speaking we don't need to worry too much about any of these things here. Um, if we wanted to, we could pretty much take things all the way back just to using the very basics. Um, however, some of these things in here that you can see refer to things called lists and collections. We're basically saying, hey look, I probably want to use some of those at some point, so let's look at leaving these things in. If I want to leave like things like pauses and have things automatically delayed, we're just loading up some kind of um, namespaces, they call them, that are available for us to look at using straight away. So we don't normally have to worry about any of those things. The next thing underneath there is basically defining the namespace about where this project resides and brings alongside of it a whole bunch of different kind of properties for organizing our project. And underneath here we've got things called a class. So a class is like a blueprint for how we're able to try and work with the program. Um, again, it goes a little bit beyond the scope of these tutorials for a basic introduction on um, classes. We're primarily going to be focusing on these um, areas in here called static void main. So the main is the initial starting point for the programs that we're going to deal with. So the static basically means about who's got access to things, the void means it's a, something that doesn't return anything, and the main is the name that we've given something. Okay, So this one is automatically generated for us with a capital M at the start. So this is a convention that we'll try and talk about a bit further down the track when we're trying to create our own methods. Down the bottom here we've got a, an error list which will help 
us to work out errors, which is a big part and parcel of learning programming languages, making sure that when we do get stuck, some of the tools and options available to us through this environment are able to help us. Over the right hand side we've got this something called the Solution Explorer and as we get into bigger projects and we start making um, our own classes and uh, forms etc you may see additional items that pop up through here. If we have ever um, lost our code and we can't find it for some reason and we've managed to somehow close out of this particular window by double clicking on the program.cs that will um, bring this programming window back up. If we've made a complete mess of our initial desktop and we've gotten rid of lots of these things which are going to be required and we've closed things down and maybe shut things off by mistake, we can look at resetting our um, windows by using some of these icons that you can see across the top here. We've got the ability to have a whole bunch of toolbars pop back up, but probably the easiest way to do is to go back and reset window layout back to the default and then all of those things that we took away apart from the error list are back showing again. Alright, so this is now going to talk to us about um, where our code goes, which is where our focus needs to be. So C Sharp is a strongly typed language, which means that we've got to be quite particular and careful about how we declare the things that we're going to use, and we've got to be a little bit particular about how we finish off statements. Some languages like Visual Basic are pretty um, is a lot more forgiving with what we can do. C Sharp um, requires us to be very precise with the way that we name things, with the way that we use things, and the way things are passed across, which is a pretty good thing because it means that we're having to make conscious choices about what we're doing. All right, so the first thing that we probably want to do is look at going about um, outputting something to the window to make sure the program is correctly installed and that we're able to get some kind of output. It's pretty traditional for us to use something like um, a little statement called hello world and one of the ways that we can do that is by using a statement called console.writeline. The console you'll notice has popped up in a slightly lighter color of blue like a teal color and this is using something called the console class. This is um, that window that I showed you before that was black and it knows that with the console class there are several things that I can do with it. One of the things that I'm able to do with it is that I can go through and write something into it. The thing that I can write into it in this situation will be the text hello world. Any text that we would like to have written onto the page directly like I've done now need to be wrapped inside quotation marks. These quotation marks indicate that it is a string and that it is able to be printed directly to the screen. If I was to push F5 now on my keyboard you'll see very very quickly a little black window has appeared so it's done exactly what I've asked it to do. In order for us to see what is happening a little bit more clearly, we need to go through and use another statement in conjunction with the right line. And this is going to be console.read key in this instance. Now when I push F5 on my keyboard, we'll come up and push the start button, it will go through and run my program. So what's effectively happening here is the console window has popped up, I have altered the right line property for this console, and I've outputted this string hello world into this console window. It has now come down and executed this line and dropped down to this console.read key. So the console is now waiting for me to do any other input such as push a key on my keyboard to for it to finish. So I'm going to go now and tap in your key and you'll notice that it's now finished the program. So I don't have to push enter, it just simply um, was waiting for me to type any key onto the keyboard. So it can be useful if you're wanting to maybe do things such as pushing like an escape key. It will quit the program. So any key on my keyboard, including function keys, will also um, help us to get outside of the program. Alright, so that is what read key does. If we have a, con a term called read line at the end, what this does is basically will wait for us to type something in and then go about pushing the enter key to go through and to return back to the statement. That's useful for when we're wanting to remember things that have been typed in from the user. Other things that you'll note, if you've learnt Visual Basic in the past, the main difference is that at the end of each of our statements we need to use a semicolon. This indicates that we've hit the end of the line or the end of the statement and then we would like to drop down. So we'll pretty much use a um, 
semicolon at the end of each line apart from when we're dealing with different um, control blocks such as if statements and uh, looping structures. Okay, so when we're dealing with um, wanting to do inputs and outputs, these two lines of code will go fairly um, closely linked hand in hand. A um, couple of little shortcuts, rather than me typing up the whole console.write line, one of the things I can do is just type in CW inside um, C sharp, double click the tab key twice, and it will automatically generate for me this whole console.write line statement. And then again, if I was to push in the likes of um, normally quotation marks, Um, sometimes the quotes will also come up um, as a pair as well. Okay, so all of these things that you're seeing that are popping up are items that the console knows how to deal with. So we've got things like read, read key, and read line. So the ones that we'll primarily use will be read key and read line. And if I was to automatically want the read line to finish up, rather than me typing the rest of it, if I was to just go through and um, do it like an opening and closing bracket, that are rounded, it will go through and finish the rest of that statement for us. This is something that this integrated development environment does for us, which is the IDE. In this situation we're dealing with C Sharp IDE or Visual Studio IDE, but most programming languages will have an integrated development environment that will allow us to go through and quickly um, do some of these commonly used tasks. So that's pretty much how we can read um, a, a, a key being pushed by the keyboard by using the read line or read key statement and if we're wanting to output something we'll use the read uh, sorry the write line statement it's important that we use the rounded parentheses or brackets to go through and indicate that we're wanting for this to work if we were to miss off one of those brackets we will receive an error when we try and run the program this error can be indicated with the fact that now if I was just to zoom in you'll notice a little bit of red underlining if I was to bring up our window before which had the error list I may need to have a little look to see where this might be. Okay, so it's listed under here for error list. This will pop up and tell me what it's expecting to have plugged in. So in this case, it's trying to be really helpful by saying I need to be using the likes of a random bracket in order to finish this statement correctly. Another thing that is often very common for us to do is to accidentally delete some of these um, brackets here. We refer the, to this as a brace. Okay, so braces need to be used as both opening and closing to finish off and start um, blocks of code. So in this case, this static void main is indicated as a starting point with an opening brace and then is finished off down the bottom. One of the things that can be quite frustrating is when we've accidentally maybe copied or cut and pasted some code and then we've maybe gone and deleted a couple of these out and then we're seeing all these ex expressions as errors down the bottom. So pretty much one of the things that we can do in the first instance is go and try and add some of those back to try and clear those errors. Sometimes it might not be obvious how many of these you've deleted or maybe added in and in the, as a result it can be a bit of a, a problem that might pop up. So in this case I've actually got one too many braces and I'm now seeing this error here down towards the bottom. So because of the fact that it has been indicated as a bit of an issue, one of the ways to that we can try and find that is by selecting and um, highlighting one of those braces and then you'll see the matching brace being highlighted at the bottom. And so because they need to be used in pairs, this can be a way of being able to identify a brace that perhaps is missing. So I certainly know that when I was learning C Sharp as a programming language, this is one of the frustrating things that I found. And so that could be some techniques that you could use to try and perhaps overcome that. So that's how we can go through and um, do our initial program of Hello World, which is a pretty commonly used program to use to set up. But now let's go about making some things more a bit more useful. So one of the things that we often want to do is to be able to remember something that is being perhaps asked. So as part of this program here, we're going to ask the user to please type in their age. As part of this, we would like to remember what the user types in. So presently at the moment, my program is simply going to be ending as soon as I push the Enter key, rather than actually remembering what the user's plugged in. So this brings us to a concept called the use of variables. And when we're dealing with a variable that would like to remember text, we use a variable or data type called strings. So strings are found in lots of different programming languages. In C Sharp, we declare all of our variables by saying the data type that we'd like to store this as at the beginning. In Visual Basic we do this towards the end by doing say dim name as string. 
In this situation within C Sharp, we will use the word string and then whatever we'd like to call it using a logical name. Now there are some um, variable names that should not be used because they might be used by the program, but in this situation the variable name of name is going to be suitable. You'll notice that we've got a bit of an issue in the fact that we've got this red that's because it's expecting us to be ending the statement with the likes of a semicolon. By clearing that now, I'm able to clear that error. There is now a new error, or potential error, that is now being indicated. It's saying that I've used or declared the variable name, but I've never used it. And that's the case because I've never given it a value. So I could come up the top here and give this a value. And this is now going to clear that error. I've actually gone through and declared this and it's now popping through and it's being given a value. This is called assignment where I'm making the left hand side of the equation equal to the right hand side of the equation. If we're wanting to now go about um, writing this back I can simply come through and I can in place of putting things in quotation marks I'm now going to put the variable name of name instead. What this will do is rather than actually having to type in my full name, it will go through and refer to this item. And this item is currently holding this text. If I was to then have my console.read line at the bottom, it will say this statement first, it will then go through and say my name, and then it will do a pause until the user has pushed the console.read line. If I was to go through and do things in a different order, or sequence, this will change the flow of the program. As a result, I would see this statement being prepared, I would then have a pause, and then this would not actually be able to be seen because it goes away so fast. So the sequence in which we place things is important when we're programming. Try and run the program now, you'll notice those two lines of code, or two statements, appearing. When I go through and push some stuff into my program, push enter, all of that pops away. So string variables are very common to use. Another thing that we're going to try and do here is I'm going to do some, something called concatenation. Concatenation is where we're wanting to join things together. Generally we're often dealing with strings. Okay, so in this situation I'm wanting to say please type in your age and, and then follow this up by my name to try and personalize things. So there's a couple of ways in which we can do that. We can use concatenation in C sharp by using the plus symbol is one instance and then we can refer simply back to the variable which contains my name. I'm then able to look at getting rid of this code by either deleting it or by doing something called commenting things out. Commenting code out can help if you're not wanting to delete it permanently but you're just wanting to have it skipped by the compiler as it runs through this line of code. So it's now going to hit this line of code, realize that the name is going to be given a value of Mr. Devitt. It will go down to write this string here, hello world, please type in your age, and then it will join on my name at the end. It will then skip over this code because it has been commented out. Comments are useful to try and describe what is happening in our code, um, to also in this situation to blank out a code from um, being run. And then finally, we'll give our pause. I run the program now, have a look, you'll notice that my name and the statement is being joined together. You may also notice that it's not very nicely done, there's no space between the word age and mister. So as part of this, we would want to go through and format this by simply putting in a hard-coded space such as this. Sometimes we actually need to put hard-coded spaces in directly if we're wanting to maybe go through and join some other things which don't allow us to put the spaces in manually like I just did before. This will have the same effect now as I just showed. Next thing that we probably want to try and deal with here is to actually have this person's age plugged in and remembered. So the next data type that we're going to deal with is an int. An int stands for integer. Integers are whole round counting numbers and they can include negative numbers and positive numbers. So we're dealing with up to a range of about negative 2 billion to about positive 2 billion. So they can handle some pretty big um, numbers. When we need to go above those, we're dealing with different data types above and beyond those. So in this situation, I'm going to give it a name, and I'm going to give it an, uh, a variable name called age. The next thing that I like to do with all of my data types that have some kind of number associated with them, I always go through and I initialize them. I give them a starting value. In this case, I'm giving a starting value of zero. If I don't go through and give it a starting value, and just to finish off this code like so, 
In some cases it will be fine, in other cases it may generate an error. The reason why I like to go through and give those a number is so that anybody looking at my code has a really clear understanding of what things are set of, set at to begin with. So the next thing I need to do is a statement called assignment. So we've already done some assignment up here with the likes of these equal symbols, but what we'd like to do is while the program has been run, I would like to remember what the user has typed in. The user is going to type into this thing called the console.read line. When I push enter, it is going to remember that. But at the moment it's got nowhere to remember this too. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell it to remember what is typed into the console, and then we're going to assign it to this thing called age. The error that you can see down the bottom here is because of the fact that a console deals with strings. That's when we, when we write things into a console, we're dealing with a string. So to make this a little bit more clear, I'm going to go through and just change the scenario around a little bit, and then we'll come back to this in a moment. One of the things that we can do instead of um, declaring the variable across the top here like so is that we can actually have things overwritten. So this variable name at the moment is holding Mr. Devitt, but while the program is running, I'm now going to overwrite this with something else. And again, this is where the likes of sequence becomes really important. I'm going to ask it to type in not their age, but their name. And as a result of that, I'm probably going to remove this last part of the sentence to make this make a little more sense. Remembering semicolon at the end here. So what has now happened is that when the program is run, this person's name of Mr. Devitt is going to be overwritten by this line. It's going to take in what the person has typed in and it will store it or jam it into this variable here. If I was to now go through and output the variable of name, you will notice when I run the program that the person's name that is plugged in will be shown twice. And that's because I'm going to type it in here, it will then output it here, and then it will give me the pause to see what I've written underneath. Okay, so if I type in the name Bob, it is going to read this now into this statement here, into this console.read line, assign it to this value, and then straight away it is going to output it here. I will go through and add some additional code so you can see this perhaps a little bit more obviously. Okay, so here is our concatenation or joining statement. Okay, and if I go to look at running this program now and type in the name Bob, you'll notice here that it's saying hello and the string or the variable here of name. Okay, so that's how we can look at joining the likes of some of these variables together. Now going back to our original example that we had here is the fact that because our console always wants to deal with strings, when we want to deal with a number, Visual Basic, uh, sorry, C Sharp is a strongly typed language. We need to make sure that the data type that it's able to deal with is correct. So in this situation, because we're typing into a string, but we're wanting to give it to this integer data type, it's having a bit of a problem. It's saying, hey, look, I can't implicitly convert type string to integer. So if I can't implicitly do it, I need to override things and explicitly tell it what I would like to do. So one of the ways that I can do that is I can use something called the convert class. This is allowing, going to allow me to convert things into an integer. And you'll get different um, levels of precision in terms of the size of the integers that you'd like to deal with. Generally the smaller the data type that you can see there will be more efficient, it will hold up less parts of memory. However, it will also only be able to handle smaller numbers. So in this case, because I'm only dealing with small numbers, it will be fine to use the base 16. Okay, and if I'm wanting to go through and then work with this, I will need to use a bracket. And because brackets need to be used in pairs, I will need to put another bracket at the end of it. Okay, so you'll notice here that I'm going to read line this in, and then I'm going to convert it into an integer and store it in this variable called age. If I go and run the program now, in fact I'll need to go through and do some, some additional work. that I'd like to do here is I'm going to put 16 
is the age of, and then I'll concatenate or join on, the name that was entered from previous. So you can start to see now how by asking perhaps a series of questions you could build up a good series of responses coming through. Okay, so it's going to be looking to join on the person's name and the age that was plugged in previously. If I click on the start button, type in the name Bob, hello Bob, next bit of code here, it's then outputted that name back once more. Okay, but what we're wanting to do is also ask the question. Okay, uh, whoops, sorry, I didn't ask the question well enough, okay. We were going to ask to see what is your age. So by doing this now, it will join on the person's name, it will say what is your age, and it will store this in this variable age, which we can then read back to the user. Okay, so 17 is the age of Bob. So this side of things now is all working as expected. There's a few little enhancements that I might like to try and do here, such as the person's name, if they type it all lowercase, that might not be a good thing. So there's a bunch of different methods that are built in which allow me to convert things to say uppercase. Or if I was to try and do conversely to lower, that is also a way of being able to convert things to all lowercase. Those can be useful when um, we're trying to do things like passwords or usernames for instance for logging onto our school system whereby we don't want to have them being um, case sensitive but things like passwords perhaps we do want to be case sensitive. So two upper and two lower are two useful methods for when we're dealing with strings. Okay, so if I was to show you this here now, two upper as a method, try and run this now as a program, you'll notice that when we go to run it, if I put things in lower case, it will output and show this now as being stored as the name Bob, all capital letters. Type in this again, and this has now been overwritten and stored as capital letters. So that could be a useful little skill to try and remember. Alright, so going back to this example that we had before, whereby we've now stored and converted what they typed in into this data type. This data type here of an integer is one that can handle whole round counting numbers. However, we often need to deal with real numbers or decimal numbers as well. So in this situation, um, we've got a range of different data types that we can use. A float is a different data type, and this allows for um, decimal numbers to be plugged in. If you need to have numbers that are quite large, the next size up from a float is called a double. And for most of the programs that we're going to be developing, doubles are generally a pretty good data type to look at using. Okay, so most of the programs that I kind of do, unless I need to know that they're definitely going to be um, um, a whole round number, I'd, I'd pretty much use doubles. One of the issues with doubles, however, is that after about the 16th decimal point, the program starts to lose a little bit of precision. So that's not generally a problem for most of the programs that we're going to try and work with, but if you are dealing with probably very small tolerances, like sending I don't know, space shuttles to the moon, etc., where those small tolerances could be the d difference between actually hitting the moon and not. Some of the starter types could not be, that could be an issue. Dealing with money, we also want to have quite a good level of precision, so one of the things that we will often use is a data type called decimal. So if we're wanting to perhaps have decimals for dollars being stored, we could go through and indicate that we'd like to work with the decimal system. Now with decimals, one of the things that we'll often be expecting for dealing with a decimal is the fact that we would want to have things defined with say maybe two or three decimal points. A good example of that could be say the GST content. Okay, so GST is currently 15%. Now representing that as a decimal number, um, I would be putting that as 0.15. However, we're having a little bit of a problem down the bottom here as an error. And one of the ways that we get around this error when we're dealing with decimals and assignment and giving it a starting value is that we put on a little M at the end. This is indicating, I like to think of it like money, so when I think of this com commonly used data type of decimal, I think of money, M for money being stored here. Um, technically if we're wanting to do this for things like um, our double, 
so our height would be a good example of perhaps using a double for this I might say that I am 1.7 meters if I was to avoid putting on some kind of notation like I did there it'll take it in fine but if I wanted to be particular about um, maybe using a convention I could put on the letter D at the end of things to try and show this is the case if I'm dealing with a float um, I could say oh look the weight of the, my weight and I could say that hey look I am um, 79.3 and then I could put an F on the here on the end so that's a way of actually having some good practices so when we're wanting to initialize or set our variables to begin with those could be some nice conventions to follow other conventions to follow with our variables is to make sure that we're using all lowercase names and the reason for that is because it just means that we're easily able to see just at a glance if they're all lowercase that they are just a local variable when we're wanting to have double barreled names uh, we use a convention called camel case and camel cases are used to try and help indicate where the start of the next letter is by using a capital letter so we always start off with a little letter to start with and every new word is shown with the likes of a capital okay so if we're wanting to do it for the likes of weight range this is how we would go through and then um, declare this variable another type of thing that we sometimes work with is something called a constant so a constant, a great example of a constant, would be the likes of GST. Now GST is something that is not changeable. So it's, it's set by the government and the program is not wanting to have this updated as we are moving on. When we deal with constants, the convention that we use and lots of programmers will use is the fact that we want to have these all capital letters. So if I was to see something all capital letters as a variable name, I know that it is a constant and cannot be changed through the main running of the program. The only way that this can be changed is for me to physically come in and look at changing things back down. So for instance it used to be 12.5% which we indicated like so, but if I wanted to actually change this I'm not able to run um, overwrite this through my code. So working with constants, because sometimes we can't change a constant or we can't change a constant when we're running things and we might want other parts of our program to have it, we sometimes want to change the scope of variables and that is who has got access to this variable. At the moment we are working in this thing called static void main and you'll notice that this finishes down towards the bottom. Later on in this tutorial we'll show you how you can go through and look at creating additional methods which is what this is and as a result we may want to have some of these variables be able to be accessed across other methods. If that's the case what we do is we take the variable out of here and we can place it inside of the class program which means that all items inside of the class have now got access to this variable. It's not quite a variable in this situation because it's a constant but all parts of the program have now got access to this constant and can use it. If I was to go in through and take this variable across up the top it means that this variable can actually be changed by other parts of the program. Generally speaking we try and avoid doing this as much as possible because of the fact that if everything's available up here everything can use it as part of our program and as a result of that we may run into a few little problems because things are being overwritten and changed later on. So I'm going to look at perhaps just leaving that one constant across the top there because it can't be changed through the running of my program anyway and I might think that that's quite safe for me to try and leave that up there. Okay so that's pretty much covered off how we can look at um, working with variables and how we can look at doing some basic inputs and outputs. The next thing that we want to try and get into here is the likes of conditional statements. So conditional statements are where we give the program a choice. Okay, and the way that um, C Sharp allows us to do that is through the use of if statements. If we were to go through and to try and type this in, um, I type in the word if and push tab tab and it will go through and put the remainder of the sequence there. So tab tab fills in basically and shows you the structure of the way things need to be. Items that are showing up in this case in yellow are things that you would then try and change. So in this case it's saying that the expression to evaluate needs to be altered. So in this case here I'm wanting to know what is the person's age. So if the age of this person is maybe less than a certain number, if it is less than zero I think that is ridiculous and it should not be allowed. So I might want to go through and 
say that it's impossible. Now, the person's age at this situation is always going to be set to zero because of the sequence of this program being wrong. Age has been initialized and set up here to zero. So in this situation, it will never trigger this bit of code because age is actually zero at the moment. It is not less than zero. So in order for me to make this work correctly, I'm going to drag this block of code up above the other block of code. Okay, so I'm going to break this, drag this bit of code up here. And there's part of this code here that when we start to run it, it might start being a bit confusing. So one of the things I'm going to do now is to comment out big sections of code. Now I can do multiple lines of commenting by pushing the forward slashes twice before each line, or I can simply highlight big blocks of code that I'd like to comment out. Okay, so if I come up the top here, you'll notice there's a little item called comment out the selected um, lines or I can use the shortcut keys that are being indicated here. By doing that now in one fell swoop I'm able to go through and block that out. These are the two lines of codes that I'd like to actually keep so I'm going to now click on the other uncomment button to disable that. So it will now go through and read this information back and output this ask the person's age to be plugged in and if they plug in an age that is less than zero it will then go through and perform that bit of code there. I'm going to use this little block here of console.readline because if this condition is met I'm going to see a statement called impossible. Okay, So I'm going to now type in a negative number. This negative number will make this statement here evaluate as being true because negative 1 is less than 0, so therefore it will do the items inside of the braces. Okay, so it's, the program has done what I've expected. If, however, I haven't um, done anything additional under that, it will simply continue on through the remainder of my program. So if I was to type in something valid that is not going to trigger this code, it will simply skip this bit of code and in this case it will just give me another pause. So when I push enter you'll notice this, this pause occurs and that's because it's now up to this line of code. Push enter again the program will finish. It can be useful to actually see the flow of your program by going through and using something called breakpoints. We hit a breakpoint by going over to the left hand side clicking the grey area and it now means when I push the start button the compiler will pause when it gets to the line of code with the red dot. In order for us to see what's going, if I put my mouse over the variables, you'll notice that age was previously initialized as zero, and it's up to this block of code here now. If I push the F10 on my keyboard, it will step through this line of code, and it will allow me to jump backwards and forwards between the console window and my actual code. I'm now going to plug in a variable, uh, sorry, a name, uh, sorry, a number I should say for my age, push enter and it's now triggered back into this code. If however I now put my mouse over the age variable you'll notice that it's been updated. Another thing that I find very useful is the use of this locals windows which pops up when I'm in break mode. I can see my local variables and how they're being updated and changed through the ring of my program. Here are some of the variables that I've currently um, got already and these were initialized further up so these are already set. But you'll notice that age has now been overwritten. It's now up to the block of code that we just did before in terms of our conditional statement. This condition is not true so therefore it will skip over this and then continue on down. Okay, So you'll notice that happened. So one of the situations that we might want to do is we want to check on multiple things. If that's the case, we will use a statement called else. So an else statement will take care of everything else in the if statement that has not been already looked at. So if I was to go through and say that if it's not impossible, it must mean that perhaps it is possible. So if they type in, say, a number of a million, this condition is not met, so it will show the word possible. If I type in the number zero, it will also show as being possible. So just as long as it is not a negative number, it will trigger this code in terms of it working. Okay, so the issue that I've got here, this is an interesting one, is because the number that I plugged in was too big in terms of the conversion type that I expected it to use. So I would need to go through and increase this to the next size up. If I go through and run this once more, 
making sure that I don't go over the billion level. I will stop the program, rerun this because it might be getting stuck in this last part. I'll try and run this again with those same values being plugged in there. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, so we're okay with that number now being used. And then it's up to this block of code. 1 million does not make this condition met, so it's going to jump down to the else statement and it will trigger this. And you can see that's being triggered because of the fact that the yellow line highlighting has occurred. It's also being shown the fact that it's up to this point of the statement. Okay, it's now going to pop down into console.readline and output that. So other things that we might want to try and do is if we have multiple conditions or things that we'd like to check. And the way that we will do that is through the likes of an else if statement. So with an else if statement we're going to have a little space in between and we can check on another condition. So because of the way that sequence works we may like to look at the next condition which could be that if you're under 13 years of age but obviously you're not under zero it means that it's finding the first condition that is true. So in this case if it's not going to be considered impossible and the person's age is under 13 I'm going to be considered a child. If I can get past that situation, I may like to look at doing the next criteria, which could be that as long as I am under the age of 20, I am going to be considered perhaps a teen or teenager. And this is the way that we can use sequence to, to um, make sure our program is working correctly. And then we can continue this on. Okay, so here's our program now. If we were to try and run this, plug in a number, say of the likes of 65 or 64, it is going to look for the first condition that is considered true. So age at the moment is 64 is not less than 0, it is not less than 13, it is not less than 20, but it is less than 65. So the block of code that is triggered will jump down into here. And you'll notice now that when we see the read line, you'll notice the fact that it's showing as being an adult. So using that concept, we can go through and solve some pretty heavy going um, kind of problems. Um, one of the things that we'll often use is an else block at the end of it to take care of everything that's left over. Okay, like so. Another thing that sometimes students enjoy using to try and help to keep things really clear where sequence is perhaps not going to be such an issue is the fact that we can use complex operators to go through and actually really tie things up. So we might say that if a person's age is less than zero and then we use the double pipe symbol. The pipe symbol is indicated normally just above the enter key on some keyboards uh, or above the shift key on other keyboards but it's generally over the right hand side. So you push shift and then the double um, vertical lines normally associated with the backspace um, space key and this represents the OR symbol. So if the age is less than 0 or the age is greater than 120 I'm going to say that this is impossible. So if either one of those conditions are considered true it will evaluate this whole statement as being true and it will therefore trigger this code. The next thing I might want to do is I might want to come in here and make sure both conditions have been met. So rather than using an OR statement, some students appreciate using the fact that both things have to be met by using something called the AND. Okay, so when we use a double AND symbol, we're going to check to make sure that the person's age is less than 13 and the person's age is greater than 0. In fact, greater than or equal to 0 is probably more accurate because of course you can be zero years of age. So that is the OR operators, that is the AND operators. You can use them singularly, however it is more efficient to use them in, um, with a double nature because if they are both going to be used it means that um, if I see an AND symbol, if this condition is not met it will never even look at the second part if I use a double AND. If I use both uh, sorry, a single AND like so, it means it will check both statements before returning whether this con statement is considered true or false. So just simply to always get in the habit of using double ANDs. There's no harm in doing this. 
Okay, so some students like to use this method. By doing that we can be very clear with our thinking. So the next situation is if the person's age is <coughs> excuse me, greater than or equal to 13, you're considered a teenager. Now by doing it in such a way, we are able to then take our blocks of code and then move them in any situation. Okay, so if you are greater than or equal to 20. The issue that we may have is that sometimes we don't go through and put the variable name of age once more. It's not smart enough to know to go back to the very start and to evaluate both against the same thing. So we're going to need to go through and put the word age in both situations. Now the advantage of this code is I can go through and move this anywhere else and the sequence is not going to be that important because of the fact that I've got two conditions that both must be met in order for this to be evaluated as true. So for instance if I was to go through and put in an age of say 25 it will be smart enough to know that that condition or that condition is not met however the next line of code here it will check to make sure both those things have been met so age is less than 65 and age is greater than or equal to 20 so therefore both of those conditions have been met and I will trigger this block of code here. As mentioned before as soon as it finds the first statement that it likes it will then drop out of this and then hit the bottom and continue on with the rest of the code. So that is effectively the use of if statements. Other things that we will sometimes try and capture and look for when we start doing things like assessments is we need to make sure that we're checking for things like this. These are boundaries, making sure that our program is being checked against appropriate boundaries. If we say that no student should be or age should be less than 0 or greater than 120, we would want to make sure that we've actually represented these boundaries. Another thing that we often want to do is to try testing our programs to make sure that it's working on those boundaries. It's the testing that becomes very important. So going through and trying to show this through evidence, I would go through and test around the fringes of those boundaries. So zero should be acceptable. The likes of... Uh, I'm just going to undo some of that, redo this. I'm going to test on the likes of negative a number. Okay, I haven't gone through and executed on things that are well beneath that range because I'm wanting to make sure that my program works on the acceptable numbers and also probably one number less than that acceptable number. So at the other end of the spectrum, 120 should be acceptable, whereas 121 should not be acceptable. Now our program is pretty smart. It is going to, however, have a problem when we try and type in something that it's not expecting. This is called an unexpected value from the standard. Now, our program, when we try and deal with this, will crash. It will say that we are expecting this to be plugged in as an integer, and it is not an integer. It is showing that it is going to be a string that's been plugged in, and as a result of that, it gets this line of code and runs into some problems. So one of the ways around that is we're going to now use an if statement to try and do something called a pass. We're going to try and convert the text that was plugged in, which is a string, and we're going to try and pass it or convert it across into a different data type. So in order to do that, I will go through, blank this line of code out, come underneath here, and I'll show you the structure and how we can do this. So it's a really useful and efficient way of being able to check our data to ensure that it can handle what it is that we're throwing at it. So there's two different ways in which we can do it. The first way that we can do it is we can go through and say the data type that we'd like to convert it into. Okay, so we're going to use a statement called try pass. The next thing is where is this information going to come from? When I push the brackets you'll notice this little grey box that appears and it's got one of two different ways of setting this up. If I click on the arrow it shows a bit more of a long-winded code. In here it's saying string s. This is basically saying where is the information coming from that is a string. So in this case it can come from a variable. If it was a string variable that we've, current, that we've used in the past to maybe store something even though it might be considered a number. Or we can access the console.readline directly and have whatever they've typed into the console check to see whether it is a valid integer or not. Now, if it can be converted into an integer, we need to begin giving it a name. So we're going to 
output it or give it out to something else. Now for this we need to have our variable that we've previously set up of age and we're going to give this variable of age this integer provided that it can be converted into this data type. Now if it can't do this statement it'll simply skip it and it will move on. So if it can go through and can convert this into an integer it will do that and it will store this in this variable here. If it can't do it, it will simply move on and this variable age will be still at the same value as was previously declared which is zero. Okay, So in this situation if it is invalid it won't generate the error that we had before but age will be zero so therefore we will be receiving the message of child because this condition would be triggered. So let's just go through and check that and we'll make sure that we're okay. Okay, so I'm going to now get to this line of code. I'm going to push F10 to trigger this code to occur. I'm going to type in something invalid such as an exclamation point. Push enter. It will pop into this code here and realize that age couldn't be updated because of the fact that it is not a correct integer and it's now left this data type alone and left this variable alone and it's still going to be what was previously assigned and initialized. Okay, So that's method one for actually dealing, dealing with things. It is a bit of a problem however in the fact that I don't want to go through and do this additional check if it isn't considered a number. So one of the ways that we can do that is we can go through and do an if statement with it. Now if statements, if we don't go through and work out whether they are true or false and specify whether they are going to be true or false, by default will be showing as true. I can keep this very clear by going through and putting things like the keywords true at the end of it. If I was to drop that off, that is what the statement would generally look at. I'm getting this error message here because of the fact that I need to use brackets in a different way. I've got the brackets in a slightly different order. Now the way that C sharp works is that a single equals symbol like this is showing how we do assignment, which is what we've done previously. We've gone through and we've made this variable equal to the likes of zero. If we're wanting to check whether something is actually equal to something and is the same as it, we will use a double equals symbol. This goes through and will now work out whether this can be converted into an integer and if so, let us go through and do that. If it can't, this whole statement will evaluate as false and we can error check all of the rest of this in a simple way. With an if statement, we don't put an end semicolon on the end, which is why we're having this item pop up towards the end here. One of the things that we're going to try and do with an if statement, as you've noticed down the bottom here, is we will use opening and closing braces to, sip, to kind of group blocks of code together. If you've only got one line of code, you can avoid using them. However, it's always, I think, good practice to go through and stick in an opening and closing brace because of the fact that we don't know that further down the track we may wish to add some additional code in here. Alright, so what we're going to do here is we're wanting to say that if you can go and convert this into a number, I'm going to open and close these braces. Now, by doing this, we've got this big block of code in here. We're going to do something called nesting now. So nesting is where we're going to take some kind of code and we're going to make it dependent on what is happening with another block of code. So for instance, I only want to go through and do this section of code if the other number that's been plugged in is a valid integer. So I'm going to cut that and I'm going to actually place this in my block of code up here. Now it's important that we use braces in the correct way. So here is my opening brace and down towards the bottom there is my closing brace. You'll notice the level of indentation shows that these if statements and else if statements are all at the same level. Now if this condition is true, it will then go through and perform these blocks of codes, trying to find the very first condition that is considered true. However, if they haven't typed in a correct number, such as they've typed in the exclamation point from previous, I can take care of that by using my else statement that, I've indic that we've used before. Oh, and I will put not a valid integer. 
Okay, so in this situation, what would happen is if I was to type in something um, that wasn't an integer, such as our exclamation point from previous, it will pop up and show this message. So the likes of this try pass um, line here, really, really helpful. This will now allow you to get your programs up to excellence level because this is going to be able to handle anything we now throw at it. We're not going to break our program provided that we use this try pass method correctly. In other languages such as VB and also in C Sharp we've used statements such as try and catch. Have a try pass is much more efficient in terms of the way that it deals with the data being passed. So not only can we look to see if it's an integer, we could look to see if it can be converted into a decimal. We can look to see if it can be changed into a double. We could check to see if it can be changed into a float. So any data type that we've covered to this point, we can look at to see in terms of can this be changed into this number data type. Alright, so that's how we can use the likes of TriPass to save, solve this. Now, with this particular program, if they haven't typed in a valid integer, we may want the program to come back up the top there and ask this again. In order to do that, we're going to introduce the next concept, which is the use of loops. So in loops, we're wanting a block of code to repeat either a set number of times or an indeterminate number of times, depending on whether a condition is considered true or false. So one of the ways in which we can do that is we're going to use another data type now called a boolean and we will go through and show that we're dealing with a boolean by using the keyword bool. So with a bool we might have things such as while a boolean is being considered true or false. Now if I don't initialize or give this a starting value a boolean is going to be um, set or assigned a value of false to begin with. However I'm going to go through and say that it's going to be true to begin with. In fact, no, I will change it and I will change it back to being false. Okay, so I'm going to use this for something called a conditional loop. Now, a conditional loop means that it will run a set um, while a condition is considered true or false. One of the ways in which we can do that is we can use the keyword while, which is one of the loops that we've got, and if we push tab tab, it will go through and automatically complete the rest of our code, similar to our if statement, showing that while this expression here is considered true, the code that is in here will run. We're going to change this to say that while valid is equal to false, I want to keep running this block of code. And the code that I'd like to run is all of this stuff here. This is the code that I'd like to run. Now as soon as they've actually typed in the correct stuff, we're wanting to exit out of this. There's one little issue with what I've got here, and the fact that if they haven't typed in something valid, valid, it will never ask the same question again, and it will never remember what is typed in again. So it will get confused. It will simply just be showing the fact that I've got an empty cursor waiting for me to type something in, but it's not very obvious for the user that's the case. So down the bottom here, I'm going to go through and ask this question once more. Okay, so thinking about where the most logical place to put this is, some students make the mistake of putting it outside of my while loop, which means it will ask the question one time only, but when it goes through and tries to repeat this loop, it will not prompt this once more. So a more logical place to put this is going to be at the start of our while statements, so that the very first thing that it does is it will ask the question, what is your age? We've previously found out what the person's name is through that other technique or in this situation because of sequence it will use my name. It will ask the question what your age is, it will try and convert it into an integer and it will then continue on through this. Now in some situations we're wanting to go through and actually have this program finish out at some point. At the moment my program is going to be stuck in an infinite loop. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to type in a valid number and it's going to keep running through this program. This program will never ever finish because of the fact that I've got a loop that will never finish because I've never altered this state here from valid equals false to valid equals true. So through the running of my code here I may choose to actually say that they've typed in a valid number. Now. It is at this point, if it can get past this line of code, it means that they have typed in a valid integer. You may choose to actually then toggle the likes of valid to be the likes of true, so therefore the program would then 
change this provided they've typed in a valid integer. So if I type in a number, you'll see adult and the program will finish. If however you don't like the fact that they've typed in something impossible, I might like to be a little bit more specific and only make it triggered if they've actually typed in a valid age that is going to meet some of those um, items there. Okay, so if I type in something that is out of range, it will still keep asking me to plug things in. As soon as something valid is plugged in, the program will finish. Now, I have actually got that valid equals true in a number of different places, so in terms of efficiency, trying to get rid of some of those perhaps and actually overriding it by doing what I had before, I could simply say, look, the very first thing I do is I'm going to overwrite this and make it true, but if this condition is considered true, I'm going to then maybe toggle it back. Okay, so that's another way of perhaps doing it. So the use of try pass is used hand in hand with um, often validation checks and range checks to make sure that we're working with the correct data types and the correct numbers and it's a really useful concept for us to try and deal with. So this is the first of our types of loops. We're checking the condition here at the top. Sometimes however we want to actually check the condition at the bottom of our code. So rather than checking at the top here, we can actually check at the bottom. The reason why we check at the top is because if this condition was not correct at the very start, this loop may never run at all. So if I was to change valid equals true at the top here, this condition is not met, which means this block of code is always going to be skipped. If you're wanting to check something at least one time, there are other ways in which we can do that. We're going to just change this block of code here now, <coughs> and instead of doing it across the top, we will do it down towards the bottom. We will do the loop at the bottom. and we're going to just change this slightly okay so the, what we want to try and do here is use something called a do loop and by using a do loop what it does is it will make sure that this block of code will run at least one time it will then go through and switch and trigger some of these valid equals falses and valid equals trues etc. And what we're going to do down the bottom here is we're going to check to see whether this is considered true towards the very bottom. So while this is going to be considered false um, at the bottom here, keep running this code. Now the reason why we sometimes want to test at the bottom is because we want the loop to run at least one time. Okay, and we're just going to put a little um, semicolon on the end here. Okay, so now what happens is that it's going to start at the top here, it's going to do this, and then it will check to see whether that condition at the bottom has been altered at all. So if you want a loop to run at least one time, checking the condition at the bottom as opposed to the top can be a useful way to go. So that is how we can use a conditional loop. The next type of looping structure that we can use is something called a for loop. Now a for loop, if I type in the word for and push tab tab, it will actually fill in this correct syntax for how things need to be set up. So it can be a little bit confusing to start with, but what it essentially does is it will do something a set number of times. So in this case it's got a, its own built-in variable counter called i for, for index. I like to probably change that to something a bit more meaningful to me, but you will often see the likes of i, j, k being used for loop counters. Um, and it's quite a common convention for us, so it's okay for us to not declare these outside of the counted loop or a loop structure because this is often where the only purpose of it is to actually be used within a loop to work out how many times it's run through. You'll notice after I updated it from i to counter that it also altered these states here. So for here what it's doing is it's setting this counter to be zero to begin with and counter is going to keep running while it is less than this value here. Now if I wanted to run something 10 times I would specify 10 here. This last part here counter plus plus means that when it hits the end of this loop and tries to rerun it the counter variable which is currently set at zero will be incremented by one so it will get up um, and be made bigger by one step at a time. So it will go from zero 
all the way up to 9 and then it will finish. It won't hit 10 because of the way that this is structured but that will actually indicate that it has happened 10 times because of the fact that it starts at 0 and will finish at 9. If I'm wanting it to go all the way up to 10 I would simply need to look at altering this timer, uh, this um, counter variable. Now one of the useful things that we can do through the likes of this is that we can use that variable called counter and we can actually use it to do concatenation and we can use that to basically show what's going on within this loop. So in this case it will actually allow us to see all the numbers between 0 and 10 being outputted onto our console. Okay, so there it is, it's going through and putting 0 all the way through down to 10. So that's how we can use it to kind of increment things up. We'll often use variables and counters and loops to go through and quickly perform tasks that would normally take us quite a long time, such as outputting maybe all of the numbers between 1 and 100. So if we're wanting to do that, there's a concept where we don't use console.writeLine, which does a um, like an enter or a carriage return, but if we use the statement console.write, what that will do is it will go through and just continue it on onto the same line. Okay, so you'll see here 0, 1, 2, etc. By getting rid of some of this other concatenation towards the end here and simply allowing it to have a comma, you'll see that those numbers when we go through and plug them in okay, are now being joined with a comma symbol and it will go all the way up from 0 to 10. Now what if we want to show maybe all the numbers between 0 and 100? Well we'd simply come across the top here and would alter this counter variable here to go all the way up until it reaches the likes of 100 or 1000 or 10,000 or a million or 100,000 I should say. So by making a couple little changes here you can do things really really fast that perhaps normally would take quite a long time. What if I was to say let's go through and show all of the even numbers between 0 and 100. Well in this situation this is the item which is telling us to go up in intervals and if we were to go through and make it go up in intervals of say 2 there are two ways in which we can do that. We can tell it to go up by going plus equals 2 which is a shorthand way of basically saying whatever you used to be counter I want you to remember that and then add 2 onto it and now that's showing all of the even numbers between 0 and 100. Or another way of doing that or representing that is in longhand method which is whatever counter used to be add 2 to it. You'll end up with the same result. If we're wanting to show all of the odd numbers between um, say 1 and 99 we would simply change the counter variable to be set at uh, 1 to start with. So that's how we can look at using the likes of a counter loop. Now other things that we'll often want to use with a counter loop is we may choose to go backwards or down. So in that case we would look at subtracting items off from it and then we'd need to look at perhaps counting backwards by altering some of these states here. So while the number is perhaps greater than and equal to zero let's count backwards. So by doing this now and altering a few of those states you'll notice that my counter is now popping down in intervals of two doing like a countdown clock. The good thing about loops is that we're actually also able to as above go through and nest things in it and so we could ask a series of questions say six times or ten times. So these are the types of things that we can do with loops. Um, we can also perform calculations in loops as well so if we're wanting to maybe work out all of the numbers between 1 and 10 added together we could use um, the likes of a loop counter to be able to do that. So let's go through and perhaps do this. So let's have an int of the, a total, we'll give it a starting point of 0 and in here we're going to remember what our past one was and then we're going to update it. So I'm going to do a calculation and the only thing I'm going to do in my calculation is this updating. So for total I'd like to remember what it used to be and I'd like to add on to it the counter. Ok, 
Okay, so in this situation it's set to be zero to begin with. We'll make counter back to zero and we will keep going through this while counter is less than or equal to 10. And then we'll make counter get progressively bigger once more. Okay, and then we will output the contents of this total once more at the bottom here. Okay, so all of the numbers between 0 and 10 added together makes 55. That can be a little bit hard to see in the first instance. If we put a breakpoint over the left hand side, run the program, go through, run to this block of code here. You'll notice now it's up to this point. Counter is set to be 0 to begin with. Push F10, F10. You'll notice that counter is still set to 0 because it's the first pass through. Total is set to 0. Notice down the bottom here we've got these variables. Another thing that we can do is we can actually pin these variables up if I can get to it. So that will pop up towards the side. And maybe I'll try and pin this variable here as well. So you can see how these are updating as the program is running through. So on the second pass through the counter variable has now been incremented up by one stage and it's now going to update the likes of my total, total, total being changed. If I have a little pause you'll notice that at this stage after running through five stages of my loop my total is now up to 10 and this number will get progressively bigger until we are finally at the counter being equal to 10 and then it will stop. Okay, so counter equal to 9, it will set it to 10. Okay, so in this situation it's now up to 11, which means that we'll just do one more little check to make sure that it's okay and that um, we have gone outside of that range. And you'll notice that last time it didn't actually hit this line and highlight it because it jumped over and did the bottom. So that was what happens when it comes out of this acceptable range. And there is my final answer here. And you can check that obviously out in a calculator and stuff like that and all those numbers. So the use of loops are really helpful when we're wanting to solve like mathematical problems, um, when we're wanting to kind of fill things up such as lists or arrays, which is one of the concepts we're about to um, look at shortly. But we've pretty much covered most of the main types of um, basic structures that we'd normally expect students at level one to be able to grasp. So the next tutorials will focus on some of our level two concepts.